Good evening and welcome to this Farm Advisory Service webinar as part of the Sustainable Sheep Systems Project. Uh, tonight's webinar is titled Opening the Doors to Outdoor Lambing. And tonight we'll be hearing from our guest speaker, Sean Custer of Laga Farms, uh, about how they've transitioned part of their flock to an outdoor lambing system um, and how they're optimising that for lamb survival and, and good production. Um, my name is Daniel Stout, I work for SEC Consulting and also behind us in tech support is Craig Bothwell and Hazel Lawton, who will be there to field your questions over later on. Tonight's webinar is actually the sixth and final webinar in the series. Uh, there's been some tremendous webinars, um, very enjoyable to do, uh, hugely informative as well. And tonight we've got one on outdoor labbing and that's with Sean. Um, the running order tonight will be roughly an hour, finishing about 9 p.m. We'll have a presentation from Sean, a short presentation from myself um, about an information what we're doing on outdoor lambing, and then we'll have a Q&A session at the end. So plenty of time for questions. Uh, I'm sure there'll be plenty. It'll be great to have a bit of discussion. If you have a question, there's two ways to do so. And um, we'd ask if you've got a question for myself and Sean at the end, please put that in the Q&A section. Um, but if you want to talk to us privately, please use the chat function if you've got any issues with tech or anything like that. Um, and we'd also like you please to test that. Could you please type in the number of attendees? So if you're, if you're with someone else watching today at home, could you please tweet a, a two or a three, depending how many of you are watching? Uh, that would be much appreciated. And I'm going to hand over now to Sean to talk about his lambing system in Orkney. Right. Good evening, folks. Um, I guess, first of all, I just thank you all for tuning in and uh, I hope that I can entertain you in some sort of fashion and um, maybe you might learn something, maybe you'll not learn anything, but at least uh, you'll uh, know about uh, a sheep system up in Orkney and, and what we're doing. So first of all, I'll just give you a wee kind of background of the firm and what's um, what's going on. Uh, Lager Farms was first started back in 1952. I'm actually the third generation farmer of this farm. Um, my great granddad and my granddad came over from one of the North Isles uh, called Papa Westry. They sold a small craft to uh, in a fishing boat to uh, get enough money together to buy Lager, which is the home farm. They, they bought 65 acres in 1952. And um, from 1952 until now, they have, I counted up today, they've bought kind of nine different crofts that's amalgamated all into one now. Um, crofting would have been probably the main type of farming in Orkney back in those days. And I suppose it just seen a transition in the 70s and 80s where farms had to get bigger and, and more efficient. And I suppose farming's kind of going in that way just new, just just the same. So um, I would say a big, big thanks to me uh, before fathers for working hard to give a base for what we're doing now. But on Lager, we are running 750 clean ewes. Uh, they're all performance recorded with Signet, um, been so since 1999. So we're a long way uh, down the line with that. And um, we run a uh, 400 ewe lambs. We keep just about all the clean ewe lambs for replacements and for selling gimmers then the following September at the society sales. And we also breed around 50 to 60 clean tops each year. Again, for society sales, private sales, and uh, Kelso and just, just anywhere we can really sell them. We also run 60 commercial sucker cows and uh, another further 10 pedigree limousins and 10 pedigree shorthorns, which is say uh, for breeding bulls and, and heifers and what have you. Um, and the commercial cows are just made up of a base of the two. But um, that's kind of the background of Lager. It's run at the moment, my father and his brother are two 50% shareholders for the director of Laga, and I am just an employee. Um, I would like to be able to do a wee bit more, but everybody who's worked with a father will tell that uh, there can be a power struggle goes on sometimes, but it's, uh, it's all healthy if it's all 
when there's a lot of passion involved, but um, that, that's what we're doing. So on to the next uh, one, a new opportunity came up in 2016. Um, there was a croft and another croft uh, within where our farm situated that came up for sale. Knew it was a place that had an old, that was the old Janet of the school. He was a wee bit of a hermit and all he had on that 50 acres was four Highland horses for probably the last 30 years. The farm, the croft was in, in dire state. There was hardly a fence on it. There was no water. There was a, uh, it, it just really hadn't been farmed for and like anything for for years but luckily i secured a new entrant couple grant and um went ahead bought the croft there was two sites on it i sold one of the sites just to grab a wee bit of money back and uh that we, we kind of took it from there really it's um it's just gotten a complete overhaul i would say the first year we got it there. We, we went to work on it. Um, in the first year, I bought 20 ewe lambs and 40 gimmers being Romneys. This is start me flock. That's pretty much all it would hold at, at that time. It was a case of just uh, hemming them in any way we could because there, no, there was no fencing and there was no water. So it was running YBCs and things like that. It's just that was a disaster. But after a, a lot of work, we reseeded the whole thing. Refenced the whole thing. Um, there's 3,000 meters of fence and went up, 400 meters of drains, and uh, now we have uh, quite a nice little unit, really. Um, and then we're thinking, then got this extra land. What we're going to do? We're already working quite hard as it is, pretty strapped, especially at lambing time. Uh, we lamb the 750 cleanse inside and there's only really my mother and my father does the lambing and my uncle does the, the calving at the time and myself does the lambing. A lot of spring work going on, tractor work, it's just, it really is a hectic time up here in Orkney. You're trying to maximise the spring and get everything done. So I decided to opt for a kind of outdoor lambing system just to see who it worked. We did it many moons ago, but it didn't work all that well. You got caught in bad weather and and what have you. Um, so I we, we went to the outdoor lambing for something easier. Um, I, I'd done a couple of stints over in New Zealand, shearing and shepherding and things like that. And I was quite impressed though how that boys had they uh, like managed the sheep. To kind of get on with themselves as much as possible and i thought although we're at the north end of scotland there's no there's no reason why i can't get a similar sheep and try and breed the same principles and uh, and, and and take it for the end and see what we can achieve um health reasons too it's a lot healthier outside so why romneys again i would say probably from my time in new zealand there was two breeds of sheep that really shine for me over there and the one with the Romney and the other one was a Perrindale. I thought they were a uh, just cracking sheep like they just they just seemed to get on with it. They're great mothers. Um they maybe didn't look quite as fancy as, as, as some sheep you see but um what they could do with the ease of management and impressed me. So to the left there's actually a, an aged Romney U with two Aberfield lambs at foot. And on the right hand side is a Romney U lamb with two Chibiot lambs at foot. So that is my kind of first attempt at breeding a Perrindale a sheep, the Chibiot Romney. And I'm quite quite happy with who that's going um, this uh, this year. It's the first year of it. So that was kind of my, my reasons behind Romney. It's just the, the pelvic size, the milk, the mothering. And uh, probably the extra wool cover for lambing outside is a, a great benefit too. So we could probably go on to the next slide. The flock new, like I said, I started with 20 ewe lambs and 40 gimmers. Uh, last year, uh, I ran upwards to 300 ewes on the same 
same bit of land. Um, I did rent seven acres off my father um, just to ease things a bit because we're quite happy with who it's going and, and the, the other members of the staff around here are thinking, well, why would we, why we breaking our backs inside when these things are getting on wet um, outside? So um, that was, uh, that, that's kind of where we're at with that. Um, the cleanse have been heavily performance recorded for a number of years, and um, I'm glad Dad went doing that route in 1999. Um, it was a good bit of foresight, and I'm certainly wanting to continue it. So although the Romneys ain't signet recorded, I am still doing the same type of uh, performance in regards to uh, U efficiency on which, what the U's are uh, rearing. And, um, as opposed to the body weight. So ideally looking for like a 70 kilo you rearing two 35 kilo lambs is, is really what I'm after. Um that was that, yeah. And like I say, the 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 50 acres is just so much more productive now than when we bought it in uh, 2016. It took a lot of work, but like I say, it's it's nearly holding up the, the 300 use. It's just a bit of and an additional seven acres is, is rented and along with some winter grazing. Um, so yeah, and the, the kind of breeding policy is I try to select which I think is my best use. Last year was 80 ewes purebred to the Romney to give me replacement and to breed some top lambs. And the ewe lambs were put to the hill Cheviot just because I, I only had one Romney top, he was the father of them. And I thought, right, I like these Perrindales, I'm going to try this. And I'm, I'm really delighted with who they turned out. And the rest of them went to the Aberfield. Um, this is just because I'm a kind of shearer throughout the summertime, uh, shear right from Devon to the north of Scotland, uh, back home here in Orkney. And I've just looked at various different breeds of sheep and I've shown a few flocks of them and I just thought oh, that's a that's a nice sheep. That's a no too extreme, but it's got it's got everything you want for it. The wool of the Romney puts a lot of folk off for sell, uh, for selling new lambs. So I, I like to put nice muscular, kind of tight skinned uh, Aberfields over my Romneys to tidy them up a wee bit and uh, then folk kind of gives that ewe lamb just to, to look at it a wee bit more and give it the time of day. Um, I've actually sold pretty much all my lambs uh, already. All the weathers went three weeks ago and I kind I did a lot of kind of advertising over my uh, Lagos Livestock Facebook page and managed to shift most of the other ewe lambs off the farm. So I'm really happy with that. It's, it's the only way I'm going to manage to run 300 ewes on the land I've got is maximize the stock I have in the summer and flush out as soon as the grass grows, starts slowing down here, new coming into the autumn. New winter and late pregnancy, this is just really the ongoing battle up here in Orkney to keep use outside and in good condition for a uh, lambing time. You can, it's just, if you lose them, from kind of early winter until pregnancy, condition-wise, it's a hell of a job to get them back. So um, I keep my ewes quite tight up until about maybe three weeks before tuffing. I think a ewe, uh, it's important, a ewe that's staying as lambing outside is fat and healthy, and a fat sheep is never fat and healthy, in my opinion. Uh, so I like to keep them quite tight and I would do a big belly crutch, ring crutch, uh, pre-tuffing three weeks before, before I put them off the dairy keep. Um, I give them a Agriloid um, liquid thrive to give them a wee flush and I'm really lucky that there is a couple of neighbouring dairy farms around here that gives me keep from kind of three weeks before topping, which is kind of start November, but they're kind of wanting rid of them from January onwards. Uh, it's kind of one of my main costs is that 
this winter period, I spend probably about seven pounds a head just on winter keep. Uh, it's about 80 pence a week per head. So, um, but it's a, it's a cost I can't really write off. Um, it's, it's invaluable. The sheep get a really good flush. They put on such good condition. We're being quite intensely farmed here with sheep. Land's probably getting a wee bit sheep sick, a bit tired. And then they go to that dairy keep and it just it flushes them, puts a neck on them. Then I can get them back in January and uh, it's it's a case then, the second end of the battle and that say, when there's no grass left and things are looking a bit wet and mucky, um, I'm lucky I have a couple of plots of hill or what we call hill. It's kind of just permanent past year. It would have been heather at one time, but it's been that heavily grazed with sheep. It's quite nice and green. And we've put, we have three different hill blocks and we've put hard standings on all of them so as we can feed concentrates on your left there. This is a, a run through feeder that uh, I built just off the side of the hill. Um, the, this this particular box, fourteen acres, and I'll keep upwards to two to two fifty sheep on it, and I just go doing every day with the combi feeder there. It's a it's a bale unwinder, but I made a hopper for the top of it so as I could take pet silage, and it just takes a uh, one block of silage a day, and then uh, I just feed concentrates and top of it. Uh, the sheep get concentrates kind of about 42 days before cupping. That's probably my next biggest cost for getting them ready for lambing. Uh, it's, uh, I use that Harbro 18 and it, 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 co it cost me about another seven pound a head just to, just to feed them concentrates for that 42 days. And then I've got a couple of quids worth of silage in there too. So, you know, you're, you're, you're taking about 20 quid off each you just to keep them from kind of pre tupping to uh, late pregnancy up until, but it's it's the kind of the only way I can rest the lambing fields enough that I might have a bite of grass. It comes lambing time to get them on because concentrate stop, everything stop, comes lambing time. And uh, I think these wee bits of hill blocks is invaluable to me as well for keeping the sheep fat. I wouldn't like to, if I was lambing, sheep outside, I wouldn't have liked to be having them in at any kind of time. I think the, the walk up and down the hill, back and forth with feeder, just keeps, it's just like a human. You go a walk or a run every day, you're going to be fitter than somebody just sitting on the couch and getting up to eat the whole time. So uh, I, I, it's quite tough on the use. It is, uh, like you can tell it's telling on them, but uh, as long as you feed them and look after them, right, they seem, they seem to weather the storm. Um, could probably skip on there now, Daniel. I so outdoor lambing. Um, I have kind of four lambing parks. It's all joined up around the seating there below the bike on the left hand side. Um, it's the fields I've chosen for lambing just because it's close to the house. When I first started lambing outside, uh, we had quite a problem here with ravens and. The only fields that was really safe from the vultures was uh, the couple around the around the house, and it's just an easy, easy way to to get access to them. There's actually where you see the the old-fashioned kiln shed and the the old shed. There's a cattle grid there, so like any time I need to run out, I'm just out with the cattle grid, and I can get through that uh, three fields, four fields even uh, so easily. But where the park, where the bike is situated there, that's actually what the singles lamb on. Uh, I was, it was a really, really cold snap this last spring, just before lambing, and uh, it just burnt off any grass we did have. It was uh, snow and cold winds. It just wasn't ideal, and I was short of grass, so I just had to keep the singles up there. But it was dry and. There's a wee bit of shelter up there, and I was really impressed with who they did. But um, as regards to the green fields there, what I really, really push to do each year is say, uh, if I get a dry spell in February, I try to slurry them. We're, we're slurry tanks for the cattle becoming full, and they need to be emptied or uh, they need to be released in some kind of way to make it through 
right through spring. So if I get a dry spell in February or early March, I try to slurry those lambing fields and it makes a big difference. It just gives them that wee, wee boost just to start growing again. But like I say, this year I had grass there. I was thinking, God, it's looking good in March. And then came lambing time, we pretty much burnt the grass off and the whole thing blew away again. So it wasn't ideal, but singles is up in this this white bit of hill and then all the multiples is a uh, land doing on the green fields and to the right there you can see things that have made the there's virtually no shelter in those fields other than the couple of walls around the steeding and the 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 house there that's where a, a llama that could hide against the, the fields that's going out of the picture there with the sheep on below the house they're, the, they're kind of bigger fields and there is, there's not even a hedge or a dike or nothing. So I made six of these wee crisscross shelters. Um, they were just cheap, just three by twos with some sarking board and uh, they just interlock together. I have uh, six of them and I just put that down in the lower end of those fields. And that was just a picture I took. I was like, I was thinking, God, that's pretty clever. Last, uh, she had managed to land these two lambs in the sheltered side of the crisscross. So it kind of, I thought maybe I've made all these things and did all this work and it's no, it's no made any difference, but seeing sites like that, I was happy because it was a particularly cold night that night and I thought they're, they're sitting there pretty and she's looking after them. So I just left them alone. But yeah, that's that, we could probably skip on there now. Uh, breeding goals and selection. So following on for, the recording we've done with the cleanse, I'm pretty much just copying what we're doing outside it. I wasn't wanting to go to an outdoor lambing and not keep track of the offspring. I think this uh, like recording and tagging and recording the genetics of each rat, each lamb is it just has to be done. I think unless you're doing that, you're going to be getting a uh, use slipping through the cracks. Uh, that's no performing for you, basically. And uh, you're going to have no idea on whether you're keeping the right genetics. You could just be keeping a lot of single ewe lambs because they look good at weaning time. You can, whereas, say, uh, with it, with this recording, it really helps uh, selection time new when you're keeping new lambs and things like that. But the lambing traits I'm looking for is a uh, ewe that's lambing themselves, something I don't have the touch, and lamb vigor getting up and sucking, it's it's really, really important here. Uh, if the lamb's not coming out easily, it, it's going to slow that lamb down the stress of it. I've seen it in the carvings. You can, the, 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 the big ass calves and that, you pull them out and then they're slow at getting up. It's no difference for the lamb. Uh, uh, a ewe that's just popping it out and it's no in that buff canal for too long. There's just far more vigor in that lamb when it comes up, and that's what I'm looking for then is lambs that's bleating, getting up, and fast, uh, looking for the teats. Other traits, the one thing I have found with the Romneys, they're good milkers, but I've been noticing just all their use getting sprung udders, um, bigger teats, things like that. It's just a real nightmare for outdoor lambing. So I don't actually have a facility on the Scion for a, well, I'm just no tech minded enough to get a set up, but I could probably do it, but I'm just actually keeping that in my diary, anything with sprung udders and big teats, I'm notching the ewe lambs, so say they don't enter into the breeding system, and I've got note of that ewe's ear tag to get a cut the, the next following year, because it's one of the it's one of the things that really slow you doing lambing outdoor as if your your udders ain't right and the teats ain't right. But uh, twinning and fertility, uh, the one way I'm finding that I'm easily easily sorting any kind of fertility problem is topping all my ewe lambs. Um, I'm giving them two cycles to the top, and if they're no in lamb after that, I'm just getting rid of them. Again, it might be harsh. You know, like they would probably go for going top, no bother as a gimmer, but I don't want to run that risk. And I just think you're sorting your fertility early. You're 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 no risking keeping a you for two years. That's going to do nothing for you. Um, and with the recording, I'm also just about always keeping pairs. Um, 
I try, I do keep the odd big single if it just looks nice. If it's just a right good looking you and and because you're you're always going to get singles, but still I would I would rather keep two smaller U lambs. That's definitely a pair. Uh, and lamb weights, uh, we do this thing as you can see to the bottom there. It's a kind of U efficiency thing where all the all the U's are topping and all the lambs are topping. So like I said earlier, I'm I'm aiming for like a sixty five to seventy kilo U me two thirty five kilo lambs and uh, I can take take the rest from there. Um, there's some use doing above that, but there's certainly ones doing below that, and it's definitely something I would like to keep going doing the lino because we've done it with the cleanse new since two thousand and fourteen, and just looking back at the stats there for the efficiency, we the first year. We kept track of that in 2014. We had just over 100 um, use rearing 100 percent of the body weight, and knew just paying attention to that uh, over the years. In 2020, we had in between three or 400 for the use rearing above 100 percent of the body weight. So I think we're certainly going in the right direction. So I would like the the Romneys to keep doing that as well. Uh, yeah, so recording at lambing time. Uh, this is a wee video that I did um, just for the Facebook page. I just thought it was just how do you how do you do this? You can so one of the things we're doing here, uh, just kind of two weeks pre lambing, I am numbering the use on the side like a spray paint number, um, and I take note of the tag. So I have I just for set for pairs, it's a uh, even number and for singles it's the odd number so when you're looking in the fields if it's an even number you know she should be going with two lambs and vice versa and we're just starting at two four six blah blah, blah. and uh, writing the tags opposite and, and that way I know in the field what that use tag number is whoever having to get hold of or get close enough to sap a tag um, but it's all lambs are all tagged at buff I try to catch them just as they're kind of maybe got in the first suit just dried off enough that I can spray them, but no too soon that they're too fast for me to catch. Um, lambs are numbered the same as they use, and like I just I just kind of look and gauge them. Then who fast they're moving? Are they chasing mum? Is mum looking after them? Is the the mothering ability in the bigger stores? Uh, and obviously. Lambing difficulty, I, I know it's going to be difficult if I've got to uh, help them. Take a look at a rudder then, if it's if it's a bad looking rudder, get her in the book, not to you lambs, and uh, record the deaths, uh, if there's any reason that's all done in the scion. But here's a wee video new, oh, actually just doing doing a you and lamb outside with me, glamorous as a assistant Una. Um, so you could just play that new. Just gonna do a wee video here to demonstrate how we record with Romney parentage outside. Uh, as you can see the numbers already on the side of the U. So I have a last here in the front of my bike that uh, you just find the number 384. So her tag number 6066. So I just enter that into the reader. And then I can find find that you, you keep a hand of her enough. You can keep a hold of it. And then uh, that's me found that you spring the lamb. Record that. It's a new lamb. So just enter that details into there. I know that's a rob that's a pure Romney lamb. And it's good. Uh, then I just mark up the same side number just in case it gets lost.
with that lamb, it's a ewe lamb as well. That's what I like to see, two good ewe lambs. So Romney. And then I have a lamb bigger auction on here, so if they're good strong lambs, I can measure them from good average to poor. So, all right, these are okay, then no lamb. That's all saved on the scion. And, uh, That one done. On to the next one. So yeah, there was just an example of what we do to the well 300 odd sheep um, that we do. That was a near perfect example, just a you showing plenty of mothering ability, nice bag of milk, and two lively lambs. So that was say uh, just really what I was liking. And new, uh, I could show you a wee video or a thing I had made for the quad bike, just as I had all the kit with me. Um, just it's just a boot lambing preparation, really. Um, so you could play that new Daniel. Just uh, gonna show you something here that I've had made. Uh, this is an idea I had, so as I could have everything that I need for lambing uh, with me on the bike, because you can like most folks doing a lambing, but they need a lot of supplies with them. But uh, it's me idea, but I'm gonna give all the credit to my good pal Mark Spence who made it hell of a good hand and I gave him an idea and he's just ran with it and made a better job than that, what I would have done but uh, it's got pretty much everything I need to well everything you need on a lambing beat like uh, I've got my scion for recording things with uh, I've got all the tagging stuff going in here for recording everything that's tagged outside I've got uh, a selection of sprays different coloured sprays uh, lambing ropes, feet trimmers, blue spray, uh, some other salve in there for chap teats, uh, got our castration stuff in here, um, got calcium, and this is uh, just this me claustrum tray, I've got claustrum and I take a thermos with me every morning just so as I have it with me to mix up. I just like having everything with me so any problem you have, you can sort it right there and then, rather than going, oh God, a sheep needs that, or a lamb needs that, I'll need to go and get that for the shade, or I'll cart it in, sort it, put it back, type thing, you can do it. All in the job, got me lambing gloves, and lamb jackets in there, stuff for a uh, twin lamb, a uh, bit of lube, <laughs> you never know when you might need that. Talk tap, if you want a lambing book, get these right in the rain. Uh, notepads, they're brilliant. Uh, they can handle a bit of moisture and dampness. Uh, got me notchers and scalpel blade. Well, scalpel thermometer in that tray. Um, that's me snack drawer. Bit of protein shake there. But uh, this is like the ultimate. This is what I'm most proud of. I think it's absolutely magic. New medicine drawer. Got a Metacam, uh, well that's kind of the equivalent of Betamox LA, Sinulox, Alamizin and some Ultra Pen, it's kind of what we use most of. We draw here with the syringes, needles, that's for old needles and there's new needles and what have you in there. But I like prolapse tape in case you need to stitch one in. And yeah, oh, one last thing, little, LED light in the front. It's actually uh, surprising how much light comes out in the dark. So it's a good help saying this. It's uh, doing away with the, the one on the quad bike. Can't, can't really use it because of the, the box in the way. So that one makes up for it. And yeah, and then I've just got me sheets here for the knowing what the tag numbers are the use that's lambing outside. Uh, but yeah, that's it. Just in case it was of any interest to fellow shepherds and uh, contact me if you want one. I might be able to sort you one. <laughs> Just yeah. So um, that was the box I had made. Um, I'm of the opinion on any lambing, not just outdoor lambing. The more prepared you are, the more lambs you'll have alive. But if you're chasing the game, lambing time, if you're chasing it before you even start. 
you're, you're losing the battle. I think be super organized. I would uh, I would rather have something and not use it than not have it and need it. So, uh, like I say, I would say probably 75% of the stuff in that box maybe wasn't used hey, much. Um, but it's there. If I see a problem, you can fix it. You can what like. You go to the field and you see a problem, you go, oh, I'm going to have to sort that. I'm going to have to take her in, take her back to the shed, get what I need, sort it, put her back out. It's just all time wasted. You're, you're really wanting to be... You're trying to breed efficient sheep, so you need to be efficient yourself. You can, you've got to, if, if you're uh, pushing the pressure on the sheep to be efficient, there's no there's no excuse for not being efficient yourself, in my opinion. And this box, I just honestly can't say who, what a help it was to me. It was just, you know, just anything right there, right then, problem sorted um, or dealt with, maybe not sorted, but at least, at least you dealt with it like you wanted to. Um, and you weren't wasting a hell of a lot of time doing it. And I would say for the tagging and the recording side of things, too, you know what, like, you might have an old laptop or something like that in the front, and you're trying to carry all this stuff out. I know where exactly everything is, so if I've got a slightly flightier you or something like that, you can get the job done fast, and you're not running about the field, chasing after sheep and putting lambs back. Um, so, yeah, it's just... I, I wouldn't have liked to go back to what I was doing before um, uh, with this box now. I'm, I'm the same as probably most shepherds out there. I just live on that thing for about a month. So I wanted to be like me home and just have all my things with me. If you, if you look at any well-drilled machine, the military or anything like that, they have all the kit they need. So farmers shouldn't be any different. Um, I think it's money well spent, um, so I'm, I'm really happy with it. And uh, you can see the rest of the stuff there I have. It was just kind of what I thought was most important. But like I say, a hell of a lot of it wasn't used, but at least it's there. If I see a problem, I can sort it. And I think that's the that's the thing with lambing. Uh, lambing staff's getting harder and harder to source. And you can what like you might have the knowledge or whatever you're sharing. You get there's, there's kind of loads of kind of maybe green naive folk want to come and help you, but they don't see problems, they can't sort problems. Uh, this just helps you be that that wee bit more efficient. Um, but yeah, be for outdoor, out, any lambing outdoor or indoor, be over prepared rather than under prepared. Because when those lambs start dropping, you don't want to be chasing the game. So that's what I'd say. And that this is say uh, another thing here. I didn't going back to the ravens and just for other reasons. I don't actually castrate the rat lambs when uh, they're born, like when I ear tag them. I think it's a kind of vulnerable time for a lamb. You don't want to be putting any more stress on it. So ringing it, tailing it's just gonna increase that little bit of pain and that might just make it lie about when you're wanting it to get up and follow mum and, and mostly suck. So I'll get in there, torn in, fill its belly, especially up here in Orkney. You, you really need lambs to get up fast and get going. So I'm no wanting to slow them down. Um, and we actually had a wee bit of a problem just with the ones lambing indoors. When, when we had that raven problem, we were finding they were attacking the lambs in groups. They were trying to separate off lambs from ewes. And they were trying to tackle the lambs just by kind of grabbing hold of their tails and pulling them to the deck. And with the ring on, it was actually stripping the outer skin off the tail and leaving a skeleton of a tail because the ring hadn't done its job yet. And so we actually stopped doing that. And this is a thing I seen in New Zealand. I did a couple of weeks tailing for a crew there and it was just so fast, so efficient. Uh, I just thought it was a good way of, of ringing lambs. It gives them that two, three weeks to get up the strength, they're, they're, by, they're by the vulnerable stage, uh, they're, they're fit to handle it. And the one thing I do do that I didn't say before when I'm marking those lambs, any cup lambs, from the cup lambs, that's a pair and they're strong. I mark them the color code, the same as the cup uh, that they went to, for, for example, around me was a green shoulder, mark them green shoulder. So then when I see them, comes tailing time, if they're still looking like a good strong lamb, I give it the chance to be a top. Um, but that, that way I can see lambs at buff, that's 
that's got all the criteria I'm looking for. And then I'm seeing them just before the crucial stage of putting a ring on. So I can pop them in the shoot and say, right, Dad, don't ring that one, let that one go, because I know it's a, it's a good, strong, strong pair. So, yeah, that, that's how we deal with the tailing from the, the outdoor lambing bunch. And this is uh, just a bit of the performance stats from uh, 2021 from the the, the Romneys. Uh, the ewes scanned 188% and the hogs was 130%. So a flock average of 179. I worked out with the number of lambs wind uh, of wind 165%. So I'm really, really delighted with that because other than a bit of recording, like doing a beat maybe three, four times a day to run run tag lambs and things like that, these ewes are kind of just left there. Uh, so I think that's quite a good mortality rate for an outdoor lambing group, especially up in Orkney, where it's a wee bit colder, a bit less shelter, and I would say certainly there's spring less grass available. And the winning weight average was 35.8. And uh, I'm really chuffed with that. That's kind of 0.8 of a kilo more than what I'm wanting the benchmark. So uh, really chuffed with who that's going. And just to the left there, you can see that's just a, a U that's just been marked and rung. And it's just, just showing a wee bit of, it's actually a big U there, I think. So it's just, that's what I like to see. I like to see that opportunity to the lambs for getting about me, again, she's, she, I'm, I'm within 10 feet there and she's going, I'm, I'm not really caring about you, I'm caring about my lambs and the lambs is bleeding and that's just ready to run where that's just a, a few hours after buff so uh, that's just ideal for me and to the right there is the replacement new lambs, that's the the lambs that, that was born this year and that's the ones I've selected <clears throat> to go back into the breeding programme this year and the uh, that was all done on how they looked themselves and who their mums performed and that's more or less all pairs so uh, it's quite a nice group of ewe lambs i'm trying to tidy the romney up a wee bit uh, trying to clean the head up and trying to uh, clean the legs up and that just because folk turn their nose up at it but for lambing outdoor up here in orkney and, and probably anywhere i think about a wool cover and that's I, I don't know what the why there's a fashionable trend to breed all this peeling sheep and just bare skin sheep you can you're you're that use and that's outside you wouldn't like to be stuck out there i went to check it on so i don't see why we're breeding sheep to do the same um and i would say out of the 300 use the romney reuse there was about four or five bad bags amongst it, just uh, things gone wrong with it. And, and I think most other breeds I see from shearing have a higher percentage of bad bags. And I just think it's the chill factor on the on the teats and the uh, things like that put, goes towards it. So I like, like I say, I like the, the, the raw meat's really good in that way. Uh, like I'll, I'll belly crutch them and ring crutch them free topping. So it's just a nice little, short staple of wool around that area, just enough to keep it warm, but not too much that the lamb can't get in there and suckle. So uh, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm quite happy with who the Rob Nace has performed this year. So yeah, that's that. And here we have a bit of new tech for um, just, just helping us with this recording. I think if you're Gonna do it, you know, might as well make it easy. And uh, we secured this on that uh, SAGS grant, um, that sustainable uh, agriculture capital grant scheme that came out there. I thought, you know, you know, maybe you're gonna get a better chance to get 60% or something paid for you. So it was something that we got. We we went for a Tapari race well with an XR 5000 way head and that was through Lager Farms application. And for myself, I applied for a Scion reader, the Scion that you've seen in the in the lambing recordings. Uh, just just awesome. Like I was I was recording the wrong music side before on pen and paper, just because I, I didn't think I could justify a, a Scion, but through that grant I have, and we've just we've just finished winning not that long ago. And 
this thing just sped it up so much, weighing all the lambs, weighing all the ewes, and just getting that data analysis on the XR5000. It's just, it's just brilliant. And like I say, we were also doing some other jobs through that too. We're vaccinating the ewe lambs with our second dose of Heptavac and, and giving them a dose as well. All the way done, just then, you know, we're doing kind of 100, 130 lambs an hour. Uh, so, you know, like for for what the recording is helping us, like and the time spent doing it, that's that's not a lot of time when you when you think about it. So um I would say that kind of concludes me talk and I just, just thank you all for giving me the time of day to just to say what we're doing here and I, I hope you enjoyed it. Um, and you can see the 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 main members of the team there, that's the dogs, Tess, Duke, Fern and Ben. Uh, love me sheep dogs and uh, couldn't couldn't do sheep farming with them but yeah but th thanks for listening and I would welcome any questions I'll try and answer them best I can that was great thank you very much Sean it was uh, I think it's a good example of how a shift outdoor lambing or a shift in breed doesn't need to compromise performance or lamb survival um, I hope everyone could see the videos okay as well They're, um, the lambing box is a tremendous piece of kit that you've uh, got put together must be very handy We'll um, just going to quickly go through an information note that we've released to the to the Sustainable Sheep Systems Project, um, titled "Promoting Lamb Survival Outdoors: Lessons from Down Under." And this looked at Australian research um, on mob size, so that's the number of ewes in a mob in a group of lambing, so the number of ewes in a field, um, and also stocking density, so the number of ewes per acre essentially, and how they influence lamb survival. Um, we know they do. We know that ewes are attracted to birth fluid in newborn lambs and a few hours of lambing, and this can lead to mismothering. So ewes trying to pinch other lambs, ewes getting interested in other lambs, and ultimately you and lamb getting separated, and that can lead to lambs um, being exposed, uh, not drinking and starving essentially, and that's increasing lamb survival uh, or decreasing lamb survival rather. Um, both can also be further impacted where you've got sheltering lamb in areas which are limited, and having more ewes or higher stocking rates going to increase um, competition for these areas. Um, we also know that greater mob size independent of stocking rate, that means particularly in twins, you've got more used in, the, in an area that they can access with more lambing fluids, more newborn lambs, and increased risk of mismothering. Um, and where stocking rate is gonna influence pasture covers, so where your demand may be exceeding supply in certain cases, that can impact the amount of grass. So you've not got sufficient covers, which kind of the go-to would be at least having a minimum of four to five centimeters of grass in front of them consistently. Um, that's gonna in, that's gonna have an impact on new nutrition, which we all know can increase, you know, influence new colostrum, poor milk and ability, poor lamb vigor, but there's also a big influence there on ewe and lamb behavior. So a ewe that's uh, malnourished will have, will show poorer um, maternal ability, should be less doting on our lambs, but likewise the lambs will be dopier. And you're going to have a situation where the lambs aren't getting suckled, ewes are losing lambs, and ultimately impact and survival. Um, there's also another factor there as well, which Sean touched on, whereby you really don't want to be supplementary feeding an outdoor lambing situation, because the ewes get excited, they all run, lose their lambs, and that can lead to separation and, and mismothering. Um, but on to the learnings from Australia. So it all kind of started off in Australia. They were looking at, they had a big large-scale producer survey um, it was all merino flocks, it was the best will best lamb survey, um, huge survey with thousands of sheep involved, thousands, hundreds of producers. Um, and what they found by asking producers that the number of views in each group and the scanning percentages they went in and the lambs that came out, they found that for every 100 views in a group, so these are big, these are big mobs lambing down in Australia, you can see in the bottom of the graph there, like up to 500 in a mob. But they found that for every 100 views you added to a mob at lambing, you were looking at about a 3.5% decrease in twins in lamb twin lamb survival. And it was less, maybe more than half of that for singles um, for every 100 using a mob. It's maybe not surprising when you think you've, if you've only got one lamb, she's better able to keep track of that lamb. And you're probably getting slightly bigger lambs at birth and probably, you know, kind of better vigor and more survival rate there. Um, and they also found that on farms with higher stocking rates, that there was a poorer lamb survival. And that could be also a factor of nutrition, but also that number of ewes in a given area and more chance of stealing lambs and lambs getting mismothered. Um, but that really kind of raised questions within their industry as to why their national guidelines, kind of got national guidelines for merino producers, would say that um, they'd recommend twin mob sizes of sort of 100 to 250. But if you do the maths on the 
survey findings, that would say that you would lose uh, about 2.25% of lambs by increasing from 100 to 250, which is a huge number of lambs. Um, so they certainly found a massive influence on this kind of mob size and that the benefits of reducing mob size. That led them to do more scientific research on it because uh, the previous was more of a survey based thing. So they got 70 farms involved uh, all throughout South Australia, right along the coast. Um, over three years, they had merinos and they had maternal and crossbreed composites. You might have been a bit surprised by the kind of probably poor, what you might think is poor lamb survival in the previous slide. Um, and they are in merinos, which as a breed are probably slightly less maternal and do show sort of poorer survival abilities than your um, composites or crossbred ewes or purebred ewes we'd have here. Um, crossbred ewes, particularly over there, quite often are a border lester over or merino ewe, and they have a lot of composite breeds now. They're very big over there. And what they did on each farm was develop a sort of four by four experimental design where you had mobs of ewes, twin ewes in, as 100 ewes in a mob or 250 ewes in a mob or 240 ended up on the average. And that was also then repeated with low and high stocking rates. Um, with the factoring, because it's a research project, that the ewes were equally balanced for body condition score and also pasture cover. So there was always sufficient cover. That's not really going to impact. You know, nutrition was always adequate. And what they found, sort of um, mirroring the previous survey, is that low mob size groups, having less using the mob, um, more than half using the mob, would improve lamb survival. So they got 77.3% as opposed to 745 So there's a clear benefit there. And when they factor that in, that was about 2% decrease in twin lamb survival for every 100 ewes you add to the mob. And remember, some of these are very big mobs, so it's quite an exponential effect. Um, and that was found in both the merinos, but also the maternal use, which links back to the type of use we have here. Um, and statistically, they found no influence on in stocking rate, but they had plenty of grass in front of them. So that might have had an impact as well. To kind of contrast that, they did a bit more in-depth research on one particular farm called Pingley. And what they found in the first year they did it, they had exceptional pasture growth of well, the covers were sitting at 2,700. So the ewes were wading in grass. You know, what we'd have in the middle of summer here. And they found no impact on lamb survival at all uh, in terms of the impact of mob size. But the following year, it was the complete opposite, it went from feast to famine. They dropped down to 400 uh, kgs of dry matter a hectare, which is nothing, just, it's dirt. Um, and in that scenario, they had to start supplementary feeding, which they call trail feeding, which we call snacker feeding. Um, and in that year, they found a six twin in the twin mobs, there was a 6.2% greater lamb survival in groups that had 210 ewes versus very small mob sizes of 55. So in those small mob sizes, there was a huge number more lambs coming out of, coming out alive, um, which equated to about 4% decrease per 100 ewes added to the group. So if you think about that on a flock that's rearing 150%, a 4% decrease of 150% would be six lambs per 100 ewes um, that were perishing, which could have been avoided if they had more subdivision and smaller groups. Um, but it also indicates that there's, a, there's some sort of relationship there between feed availability and the influence on mob size and how big an influence it has. Um, last up um, in it, we tried to kind of give some more Scottish context to it. So how can you apply this? Although yes, mob sizes, feeds, you know, uh, flock sizes are much larger over there, very different climate. The principles fairly still stand, st you know, still stand strong. Um, there's a few points here to make. The value of scanning is absolutely huge. That lets you separate your multiples. So it's about having, getting a map of the field out, planning and assessing each field and set, matching your higher risk use, which are multiples and particular triplets to the best available field. So that's pasture cover, field size. So if you've got smaller fields, you can put, there'll be smaller mob sizes. So trying to target your, your twins and your triplets into those. And if you have big fields, maybe the singles should go in them, um, as well as other aspects such as aspect of the field. So slope and things like shelter. Um, plan your lamb and dates so that you've got adequate pasture covers. This might mean for a lot of flocks moving to outdoor lambing that they move several weeks later. But if you've got better pasture covers, um, you'll better your performance, but you'll also have, uh, you'll negate the need to supplementary feed and that, that risk of mismothering. Um, to do it, to move to a system where you're mismothering a lot because supplementary feeding is a, a bit of a disaster, really, and your performance is not going to be satisfactory. 
Um, target your trim bearing use to the best fields. Um, it's worth stock and use at least seven days pre lambing to allow them to assess the birth sites and find shelter and things like that. Uh, know the lay of the land. Um, if you are supplementary feeding, as many as will, if it's a poor year uh, and you don't have the ability to maybe spread use over a big larger area of ground, um, it's worth considering that while it might be tempting to feed the twins, that is going to be a higher risk of mismothering in twins and singles, and it may actually be worth considering supplementing the singles rather than the twins, because the twins will actually will in fact do better on high quality grass if you've got fields that do have sufficient covers, um, or if you've got triplet bearing ewes um, in really small groups, then maybe they could be done. They could be done well and, and handled. Um, there's also an option here um, at lambing if you've got you're looking to kind of drift out ewes. So to try and maintain particularly grass growth lowers and you're trying to maintain pasture covers in those lambing fields, there is the option there to drift ewes once lambs are up and suckled, drift them out of the field, and that will reduce demand in the field. Um, some people have done it in the reverse, so drifting ewes that haven't lambed out yet. Um, but that's probably best advice to only do with singles because um, you don't want a, a twin in a situation where she doesn't have a good lambing um, shelter or she doesn't have the lay of land to, to find where she's going to birth um, and you know, access good shelter. Um, we followed that up. We're trying to get some guidelines on, on what you should do in the UK. Um, we looked at mob size. So perhaps in the UK, it'd be kind of easily targetable to try and reduce single mob size to under 100, twins under 50 and triplets under 30. I think that's pretty practical. Um, if you think that a group of 50 triplet user at eight user hectare is going to sit at about six or seven hectares of field. And actually many of us will have less than that. So it's really achievable. Um, and there's options for subdivision. Um, we actually spoke about subdivision in one of our previous webinars with James Drummond, uh, where he spoke about at lambing time, he'll, he'll pre-set up a lot of his rotational grazing, and he's using electric fencing to subdivide large parks into smaller parks, which then allows smaller mob sizes at lambing, and that's, that's boosting his lamb survival, and the statistics are, are really, really strong. Um, and finally, consider shelter in each field, the steepness as well. So it's not just about the area and the mob size. If you've got a steep field, they're going to congregate at the lower end, and that's actually going to give a higher stocking rate in that one area and more competition, um, and other factors such as water and uh, risk areas and all that sort of thing. But I think, yeah, it's something that's certainly certainly worth considering um, when you're apportioning your fields and uh, considering where you're going to allocate fields for different groups of stock. Um, just very quickly, I'd like to promote some of the other outputs from our Sustainable Sheep Steeps and Series since we're coming to the end. Um, it's been a tremendous run. And uh, this is the, the previous five webinars we've had. We had a whole systems approach. We've looked at late pregnancy feeding. We've looked at hogs and triplets. So that was with James Drummond. Um, also looking at triplet rearing uh, on the U and uh, breeding new hogs. Uh, we looked at strategic warming and also one on the opportunities within the halal sector. Um, we've also put out four technical and information notes. So the one we've just spoken about. Um, also a summary note on the, uh, the hogs and the triplet management one. Um, there is a technical note on recording lambing traits. So that is lambing ease, lamb vigor, and mothering ability, and how you can score them in basic ways or in more advanced sort of three or five point scores and use that to influence your breeding and management decisions, just as Sean's doing. Um, this is a handy little note. Um, and there was also one on strategic silage production and suit systems. So looking at the, the value of high quality silage but also trying to balance that. So how much do you need within a system to maximize the reduction in concentrate feed? And lastly, as well as a video that's coming shortly, we've also got two podcasts, um, one on lameness and one on mastitis, both with Laura Green uh, from Birmingham University. Um, very, very interesting podcast on the lameness front. Really enjoyed doing it. And we've also got one mastitis with Laura and Poppy Freighter as well. Um, these are all available on our link, as you can see below, um, but can be found on the FAS website if you look and you can find sustainable sheep systems and there's a whole page with everything on it, um, which will continue to update, including this webinar uh, coming up. One last thing before questions is the prize draw. So we'd really appreciate it if you could fill in your surveys, which will be emailed to you. And um, we'd really appreciate it if you do that. It's really important for FAS to track what we're doing. And if you do, we'll also enroll you in a prize draw to win 50 pounds of vouchers uh, for a damn delicious uh, butchery. And that is us. So we're gonna move over to questions.
Perfect. I think we'll maybe have maybe 10 minutes of questions and then we'll wrap up since we've gone a, gone a bit over time already. Um, we've got a question here, Sean, not at all. It's been a, an interesting stuff. Um, in terms of topping your new hog, Sean, have you got a, a weight target for that? And also, how do you get on in terms of lambing hogs outdoors? Some people might be cautious of that. Yeah, well, they would don't really have a weight target. Like I say, I'm keeping the the strongest of the ewe lambs or the strongest of the pairs anyway. They would they would all probably be over 35 kilos at winning. And one of the best pieces of advice that I got for topping you hogs is keep you lambs away from the rest of the flock the whole year. You can like I never run them alongside my ewes. So um right through topping like from now right through topping um they're, they're kept separate and they're they're kept um kind of on the best of grass and then they're, they're lamb separately too i think i did top you hogs for a few years in with the ewes and uh, i had more problems thinner you hogs and no capable of rearing the lambs but last year i i've got to say i didn't really have any more problems with them than any of the ewes. Like there, were, there maybe was like the odd one you had a swollen head and that was a wee bit slower. I had to take in uh, just till the head swelling went down. It had obviously been stuck in the passage too long with the feet, but she still managed to get out. And uh, I am also predominantly lifting the second lamb. Um, some folk might be against that, but as far as a ewe hog, as long as she's hen lambs and she's going to rear, I'd rather rear me one good one than two kind of crap ones. But uh, yeah, I've got, last year they, they didn't cause me much problem and uh, that was the first year that I kept them separate from the flock and just been really good to them right through from now on really till lambing time. Yeah, no, that's brilliant. I think there's a there's sort of industry target there for you lambs of sort of 60% of mature weight um, as a cut off for topping. Um, I think you're dead right, Sean. Keeping twins on on new lambs, particularly up our way in you know near Shetland, is um you're maybe maybe pushing your luck a little bit in terms of getting a good growth rate on the U hogs going forward as well as getting a good lamb. Um someone's asked Sean, you mentioned you know, your concentrate use in the outdoor system is about seven pounds a U. Um where does that compare to the your clins indoors? So what saving are you achieving from lambing them outdoors and not having to feed and during lactation and that? I would I would say it's just the lambing period that I'm saving, if you know what I mean. Like, I would put them, I try to keep them out onto that feeding system right up until the, the day that's just about kind of due. Uh, I change the cranes and the tops, so I have, like, a, 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 like a, a change it after 10 days, so I have the majority of the flocks, like, I call the red bums, and I have the blue bums separate. So I, I kind of knew know their due date, and I feed them right up to that stick them on the, any grass that I do have, whereas the cleanse inside, they could be fed for another maybe two weeks sometimes in, inside compared to the new ones being on grass just that wee bit sooner. So yeah, they would they would be fed concentrates longer just because the lambing inside, because they would be fed right up until the lambed and then the two days whilst they're in pain, mothering pains as well, whereas mine does not receive that. So there is a saving in that way. Yeah, no, it's certainly a good opportunity, isn't it? Um, we've got another question here. On a cold night, um, if a lamb is with its mother but looks like it needs intervention, would you catch it? Would you risk disturbing the mother? Would you leave it in the morning? Would you would you intervene? Yeah, it's it's probably more an experience call. Like like I showed you in my box there that I have like claustrum available quite often. Like if, if it's becoming dark and something's just popped. And I'm a little bit unsure about it. If I'm really unsure about it, I'll take it in, make sure it's safe overnight. And like the, the night shift lamar, which is dad, he would keep an eye on it in the shade. But if I think it's like, if I'm just not sure, but I don't think it's worth taking in, I might just give it a stomach full of claustrum just to know that it's gotten it, it's received it. And I know it's going to survive through the night if it's with its mum. You can like, uh, but then again, you, you kind of balance that up on what weather you're having at the time and just, you know, what type of night might be in store for that lamb. Yeah, no, no, dead on. Um, 
When you were working in an indoor lambing system, did you check your ewes during the night? And if so, how did you cope having them uh, to leave them through the night? Uh, we were still lambing indoors, like the 750 cleanse is still lambing at the same time. So like this is like going back to why we chose the outdoor lambing system. If we were going to keep more sheep for the staff that's available here, we had to have an easier option. So uh, the that's that's how we introduced the Romneys and they've kind of taken care of themselves. But um we we always have a nighttime lammer. We did start we did once try like putting lights and timers and things like that from the lead up to lambing, but it, it, it made no difference. And we would, I would say there's just as many ewes lambing through the night uh, inside as there is through the day sometimes. So uh, like, uh, like dad needs to be there. It's, it's kind of, it, it's just a more manageable shift for him. There's a bit less going on. You can, it's a pens are bedded and uh, you can, like, it's a case of just looking after what's in the shed rather than when everything else is happening when, when me and mum's together and, and whoever else we have. But no, uh, I wouldn't like to be lambing indoors and not have a night shift for some time. <laughs> no, um, I think we'll wrap up with one, one final question. Sean, it's been great. Um, what is your advice to fellow farms who are considering moving to an outdoor lambing system? Do they need to consider a change in breed? Big question. Yeah, I don't want to, like, I wouldn't like to, slag off any breed like <laughs> I, I think any sheep can be efficient it's how you breed them and and what you're looking for and like in the what I noticed one of the best quotes I heard in New Zealand was uh, that I would rather look at a nice bank account than rosettes on the wall you can for that list like or we're kind of fashionable trend here in the UK is to have this showpiece animal with a big broad back and the big heads and the big bums and things like that. I think if you're changing the outdoor system, you've got to change your mindset a wee bit on what a sheep's going to look like. Um, I think there's lots of things you need to weigh up, what kind of weather patterns you get and what shelters available and just, yeah, and, and, and how you're probably physically capable yourself like outdoor lambing if I have a problem it's generally me used to sort it because nobody else is fit to catch sheep things like that you can do you, you have good dogs to do it but things like that but I would say definitely you need to be looking at breeds that's already got a bit of genetics behind them for easy lambing um I have lambed various different places in my time and there's lots of breeds of sheep I wouldn't like to be lambing outside, if I was being honest, just because I don't think they have the motherly ability. I don't think they have the pelvic size. And I think lambing outside, you could, with the wrong breed of sheep, you could get into a whole world of trouble. You can, you need into, like, I could probably, I would like to lamb more sheep outside. I would, I would push for lambing some more cleanse outside because we actually like what we're recording off the cleanse and, and, and the same thing as we're doing in the Romneys is we're, we're trying to look at that sheep in a hypothetical situation that it is lambing outside, if you know what I mean, like even though she's lambing inside, if there's any bother that would cause you outside, she's getting notched as well. Like she kind of needs to be doing it on her own inside. So as if she went outside, she'd be getting on with. And uh, I think to use... Like I would go back to that thing too, uh, depending on how you're keeping your sheep up until lambing. Like if you've got a shortage of grass and you don't have an availability, like you've not got them on a forage-based system or you've got them inside feeding, I think that sheep's big, fat and lazy. You stick her outside, she'll not get doing the business the same as once it's been fed outside. But uh, I would say depending on what folks, what breeds you have and how they're doing for you inside of, if you're having to help them inside, you'll have to help them outside. You get what I mean? So uh, it, it's a kind of decision you'll have to mark for yourself. No, nope, dead on. Couldn't agree more. I think you have to you have to look at your priorities a bit different if you're moving to these systems. Um, we've got one last question before we wrap up. Um, just apologise as well for anyone whose questions haven't been touched on. We'll, um, we'll get back to you. We'll email you um, with answers from Sean. Um, so last question, Sean, is there a difference in your mortality stats between the indoor and outdoor lambing system? Yeah, I've no actually calculated up 
uh, what the Clinton's mortality rate is just yet. I must do that. But there's definitely less lambs died um, from the outdoor lambing thing. Uh, I think it's just uh, it's the start of life in a healthier environment. Like that's where you'll get a lot of your first lot of uh, deaths. And uh, I think that use that's lambed indoors too probably would follow up with more mastitis problems and things like that with bacteria getting in in the early days. So that, that all goes kind of kind of towards it. So no, the, the, they have kind of outperformed this year, but that's just, I think, down to the environment, the lambing in. And uh, like, uh, you'd love to lamb all the use outside, but then again, I'm, I'm realistic in the fact that in, up here in Orkney, you could get four or five days of catastrophic weather. That doesn't matter how good genetics you've got or what breed of sheep you've got. It'll just kill lambs. Like, it'll get cold and wet. And luckily, I've, I've only lambed outside since 2016 and I've never really had a bad spell of weather. But I do know it could come. And I think if I was to push for more outdoor lambing, I still need an option that I can take sheep in if needs be. You can if I see a really bad weather front coming, you can I wouldn't like to be lambing a thousand yows outside and have nowhere to put them. You can if, if things keep yep. pets up, whereas three hundred ewes, even if the weather's really bad, I can still manage that enough with the pains that I've got to get them in out of harm's way if that makes sense. So uh, I think a lot of folk push and push and push for this like outdoor lambing and just as little care as possible but it, it's not the case like geographically where we're in the world uh, it could just be like a, just a, a right massacre in, in a poor weather scenario so like I, I'm realistic in the fact that I don't think I could lamb all me use outside Yeah, no dead on I mean it might be lower labour in some terms but it doesn't mean lower management it doesn't mean lower um, lower thought and um, we did look at your survival earlier on and you were coming in about 8% mortality from scanning to rearing, which I think is enviable for any system um, in particular, an outdoor system or an indoor system either way, to be honest. Um, so no, I think you've, yep, yeah, it's uh, certainly proved what you can, uh, what you can achieve. So um, I think we're going to wrap up now. Um, just like to say a big thank you to Sean for joining us tonight. No, no, thank you. That'll be us. Perfect. Right. Thanks everyone for joining and good night.